Hare Krishna. So today I talk on the topic of God's causeless mercy as demonstrated in Balaram's mysterious relationship with Duryodhana. And how causeless mercy, how even causeless mercy is less for some people. So broadly speaking, we can see that in general, if we look at whichever religious history or in general, any fictional story also, there are broadly two parties, there's good and bad. Sometimes the lines may be blurred between who is good and who is bad. But overall there are the forces of good and the forces of bad. And within this there is a conflict. Now at one level we understand that God should be on the side of the good. But at the same time if God is the, is the source of everyone the Bhagavad Gita describes in 529 in the Bhagavad Gita, Surudam Sarvabhutana. Krishna is the well wisher not just of the devoted, but of all living beings. So then, one part of us feels that actually God should be on the side of good. But on the other side, we feel that actually God should be impartial. So God should transcend the sides in this world. And this tension between <clears throat> favoring goodness and transcending dualities. This is like an essential theme in the Bhagavad Gita as well as the Bhakti literature. In fact, the whole seventh canto starts with Parishit Maharaj being Asking Shukadeva Swami, no, Vishnu, help Indra. So is Vishnu against the demons? And that's how the, the first chapter in the seventh canto is the Supreme Lord is equal to all. So now, as I said, that God should naturally favor the good. But at the same time, it, it doesn't feel right that God should reject anyone. God should condemn anyone. That God should completely forsake someone in so this dynamic, this tension, Samoham Sarva Bhuteshu Priya, Krishna says, I don't play favorites. That I'm equal to everyone. And yet in the next verse he says, Ye bhajanti tumam bhaktya, maite te shuchapyaham. Those who are devoted to me, I reciprocate with them. In fact, it's a very intimate sense of Union that Krishna is talking about over there. Mai te te shuchapyaham That they are in me and I am in them. Now with this point, what Krishna is telling is that beyond God's equality is his reciprocity. That God is equal, no doubt. He's equal to everyone. The first verse talks about his equality. First part of the verse. Samoham sarobhuteshu. But then he talks about his reciprocity. However, we can say that so equality means okay, whatever you do, I do accordingly. So equality, there are three things over here. There's equality, there is reciprocity, and there is mercy. So what is the difference between the three? Equality is, say for example, now the sun is equal to all, in the sense that it gives light to everyone. Now, if somebody curses the sun. If somebody neglects the sun, it's not a sun, sun will give less light to that person. So sun is, equality means, it's almost, you could say, uh, neutrality. But, wherever there is a personal relationship involved, you cannot have relationship with only equality. So you approach someone and you talk with them and somebody is appreciating them and wanting to come close to them and there is a stone like and somebody criticizes them and again they are stone like say so, okay we might appreciate how how unflappable they are but we, want, we will not be able to develop any personal relationship with them 
unless there is some kind of reciprocation. So equality is good in principle. But any personal relationship depends on reciprocity. And that reciprocity is what Krishna talks about. Yethamam prapadyante tam sathaiva majamyaham In 4.11 he says that those as people surrender to me, I reward them accordingly. That's reciprocity. Now, mercy is something more than reciprocity. It is, you could say, that reciprocity means you do this for me, I do this for you. But mercy means that you may do a very little for me and I will do a lot for you. Or you may do nothing and I may still do everything for you. So we could say it's a spectrum. Equality, reciprocity and what a third thing? Mercy. So now, yeah. Questions at the end or? Uh, yeah, I can have now. So. Then with equality, if you gave the example that um, someone does something to you and you can still be stone-like. Is, isn't that in one sense what we are trying to be in the beginning of the Gita, undisturbed by happiness or distressed, uh, okay. equipoised, not bewildered? Okay, good question. So, in our uh, spiritual life, initially at least, are we trying to be develop equality in terms of not being disturbed by anything? So, yes. Everything in scripture has to be seen in the context of the scripture. So in the case of Arjuna, see, the Bhagavad Gita has a core that is universal. But also it is spoken at a particular time to a particular person. And for Arjuna, his emotions were coming in the way of his service. And therefore the Bhagavad Gita stress uh, is very much on an unemotional kind of spirituality. The Bhagavad Gita doesn't contain verses about, say, a pure devotee dances in ecstasy and cries tears of ecstasy. That's also then the process of bhakti. But bhakti has to be applied according to context. And context means, so for Arjuna, when his emotions are coming in the way of his service, at that time, Krishna presents bhakti principles in a way that stabilizes the extremes of the emotions. And thus he says, Sukhe dukhe same kritva labhala bhaujaya jayo In happiness, distress, in failure, success, in honor, dishonor, be equipoised. Now, are we aspiring for that at our level? We are following the Bhagavad Gita. And there are two visions of the relationship between material emotions and spiritual emotions. One is that they are opposite. That we give up material emotions and then we will develop spiritual emotions. And to some extent that is true. That say if somebody is very sensually obsessed, and then they cannot become spiritually attracted. So, Bhogaishwari Prasaktanam Taya Apaharita Chetasam so, if our emotions are caught in sensuality, then there is no consciousness available to focus on Krishna. And if there is no focus on Krishna, there is no connection with Krishna, then there is no experience of emotional relationship with Krishna. So, we could say that material emotions need to be given up to develop spiritual emotions. That's one way of looking at it. And that's true. But that's not the only way. Because material emotions can also be talked about in different ways. That means, a Krishna, a very integral teaching of the Bhagavad Gita is about sabhava, about innate nature, and how we need to act according to our nature. Now, when we talk about nature, talk about the, the specifics of the categorization are not as important as the principle of categorization. Krishna is saying that, Okay, not the point is not just to divide people into four varanas, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishnava. The point is that we have a particular material nature based on our body and mind. And we need to ensure that we work in harmony with that. So it's not that this kind of classification, it's not discrimination. You're not putting people in boxes. Rather, 
we are understanding the boxes we are already in. We already are having particular nature, so we understand that. Now when we say we have a particular nature, what does it essentially mean? Nature means we like some things. Brahmanas like to study. Kshatriyas like to manage, delegate, get things done. Vaishyas, they delight in making money. Now these are also emotions, aren't they? So are these emotions also to be given up? No. Krishna says these emotions are natural to you and use them for pursuing dharma. That's why we see later on, uh, so we can see this sense in two ways in which the word calm is used in the Bhagavad Gita. So calm can in a very narrow specific sense refer to lust. And that is talked about in the third chapter where Krishna talks about how in 336 to 43, how calm can delude us, how lust can delude us and how we need to overcome it. There also specifically if we consider the context, Krishna is not talking just about lust. He is talking about self-destructive desire. Because Arjuna's question is, what is it that makes us act against our best interests? And now if you consider, it's not only lust. It's anger also makes us act against our best interests. Greed also makes us act against our best interests. Envy also. So you could see there are many self-destructive drives within us. And calm is used in a generic sense over there. To offer self-destructive drives. But then in the 7th chapter, in the 10th verse, Krishna talks about Dharma aviruddho bhuteshu kamo smi bharata So here he is saying that kama which is not contrary to dharma. He says that is a manifestation of the divine. It is I who am present. Now here kama can be gener if we use the generic understanding of kama we can say that there are this dharma artha kama moksha and this is considered to be a purushartha. So dharma normally considered as virtue or duty it's considered very positive. Artha we might consider as functional and kama we might consider to be oh, kama is to be given up. But in the Vedic context, all three are taught in the same breath. Dharma, Artha and Kama. That means these three are normal goals of human life. But there is a check and balance system. What Krishna says is, pursue the Kama that does not violate the boundaries of Dharma. So, Kama, desire, so we could put it generically as ambition. So, ambition that is not contrary to ethics. Krishna says, I am that. You see, everything wonderful that has happened in the world is because of somebody's ambition. Whether we talk more in modern times in terms of say technological advancement or we talk in ancient times and somebody built a big temple, somebody composed a beautiful literature. It was, first of all, a desire in somebody's heart. So calm is the motive force in this world. And not all, not all desire is bad. So Krishna says, if the desire is in harmony with dharma, then that is very good. So similarly, uh, we could generically say that there are some emotions which we naturally feel in according to our nature. So some people might just feel, okay, let's go and read a book or hear a class. They feel stimulated. Somebody else, oh, we have to manage a festival. That's what energizes them. So you know, these are emotions which come, you could say, from our body-mind. They're not necessarily spiritual emotions entirely. Because somebody might feel excited about managing a festival for Krishna, but they might feel less excited about managing a festival in their college or office also. So these, are, so these emotions, we could say, are usable in Krishna's service. And those needn't be given up. They can be channeled. So are we trying to become steady? Yes, we want to become steady in terms of uh, not overreacting to life's ups and downs. But that doesn't necessarily mean we have to become completely unemotional. So the whole principle is not put all emotions in one category, but see emotions in the light of dharma. If an emotion is taking me away from dharma, then I need to keep it at a distance. If an emotion can help me in the pursuit of dharma, then that's wonderful. I use it. And ultimately, Pure devotion is also an emotion. So we could say the highest perfection of dharma in the path of bhakti is emotion. So there are emotions which are anti-devotional, which we need to stay away from. There are emotions which are non-devotional, which can be used for devotional service, which may not be used for devotional service. We have to 
discriminate. We have to analyze properly. There are pro-emotional emotions, which we can use. And there are emotional emotions. So we could classify emotions in different ways. And we want to be equipoised so that we don't get swept away from dharma by our emotions. That's the central point. Yes, please. So, kind, yeah. of, kind of related question. Yeah. When you're talking about nature and to channel that in, in the right way, taking it a step back, how would you recommend someone tries to figure out their nature? What's the best way or steps to, to find out what your nature is so that you can then channel that in the right way? Okay, do you want me to speak on Balram Jayati or do we have question answers? I'm okay so, either way, whatever serves the community so, the best. Okay. So, let me quickly, uh, I'll quickly answer this question. I'll complete the theme which I was going to speak and then we can have other questions on this topic also if required. Mm -hmm. So, as far as discerning our nature is concerned, broadly speaking, guna karma vibhaga shakshnas is quality and activity. So, we could put in today's terms quality and activity as qual if we have the quality of doing something, that means we feel good while doing it. And if we have, we have the karma of doing it, that means we are good at doing it. Two different things. I, I like to do something, I feel good doing it. And another is I am actually good at doing it. So you could say comfort and competence. So while looking at life and while looking at various roles that we are playing, various activities we are doing, we can be self-observant and see what is it that we feel comfortable doing. And what is it we are competent. And we could say that is a pointer toward our nature. We don't necessarily have to exactly pinpoint this is my nature. But even if you understand what are the activities according to my nature. So today we don't have Varnashram, so we can't necessarily get into those four categories right now. But that way we can self, uh, by self-observation we can understand what are the activities that are natural towards us. And then we can uh, gravitate toward them as much as possible. Okay. So, I was speaking about this three things. What are the three things? Equality, Equality reciprocity, reciprocity, and yeah. So now, among, um, now, at one level, Krishna exhibits all these. Because whenever we use any terms or any concepts, they are actually mental constructs, which we are applying on the complex reality of this world. And so, if we consider this to be like a spectrum, so at the one end of the spectrum will be mercy, and on the other end of the spectrum will be equality. And we could say this whole spectrum is based on reciprocity. So, in equality, as we have explained over here, the reciprocity is very, very less. I just stay equipoised. In mercy, the reciprocity is extremely high. You do a little, and I do a lot for you. So, now, <clears throat> we see that at one level, as I said, Krishna naturally loves the devotees. Now, in one sense, devotees themselves transcend the category of good and bad in the world. Because devotion, of course it's good, but it is more than good. It is not, it is beyond punya. But still, if we wanted to classify devotion in the category of good and bad, that would fall broadly in the, uh, in the category of good. So, we see that Krishna in the Mahabharata, there are the Pandavas and the Kauravas. And broadly speaking, the Pandavas are virtuous. And the Kauravas are vicious. Now, of course, as I said again, any such categorization is always very general. So sometimes the Pandavas also succumb to vice. Say, for example, Yudhishthira gets carried away by gambling. Sometimes Bhima can get extremely angry. And he just let that violent streak dominate him at times. But these are occasional. Of course, even in an occasion, sometimes the consequences may be catastrophic. Catastrophic, but still, they are occasional. Whereas if we see the Kauravas, they might also sometimes act virtuously. But overall, the tendency is to go along with one. So Vikarana was one of the brothers of Duryodhan, And he stands up against Duryodhana and everyone else at the time when the Draupadi is being dishonored. So he exhibits virtue. But overall, he goes along with the vicious ways of the Kauravas. 
Now Balaram is in a in a relationship with Krishna, where Krishna is Balram is like the perfect friend of Krishna. Yesterday I spoke on Balram Jayanti in Leicester and I talked about how you know in Krishna Leela, Krishna Leela is in three broad places, Vrindavan, Mathura and Dwarka. And there are only two characters who are with Krishna in all these places. One is Balram and the other is Rohini. But Rohini is still another generation and she is a woman. And so, so Krishna and Balram, they come very close to each other because they are throughout their life together. I talked about how Balram is the closest friend of Krishna. You know, what do we expect a friend to be? A friend should stick to us with a thick and thin. A friend should understand our heart's emotions. So, how when Krishna feels separated from Vrindavan, it is Balram alone who understands that. And how, uh, if we need to do something but we are unable to do it, then the friend does that for us. So that's how, Balram, when Krishna cannot go back to Vrindavan because he's bound by his words. So, at that time, Balram chooses to go and be about Krishna. So like that, Krishna and Balram are very good friends. The best of friends. But at the same time, when we have a friend, we want, we have various flavors of relationship with a friend. Sometimes we agree with many things, sometimes we disagree on many things. And if we disagree, then we content. It's not that every disagreement has to lead to disunity or rupture. Sometimes some disagreements can also spice relationships. Oh, you think like this, I think like this. And then, especially if there are disagreements, if the two people have a basic platform of affection among them, then they know that the point of a disagreement is not to win the argument. It is to gain an understanding. Why do you think like that? Why do you, okay. So now Krishna also in his fraternal relationship with Balram wants someone to contend with. And thus Balram plays that role. And how does he play that role? By supporting those who are opposed to those whom Krishna is supporting. So he, he, Krishna gives, or Krishna is given by Balaram somebody to contend with. So the bhakti vision of God is not that God re, resides in majest, uh, in solitary majesty above everyone else. God enjoys the rich gamut of relationships that we all aspire to enjoy in the world. And therefore, here Krishna has Balaram, who at one level is Krishna himself. Now, Krishna and Balaram are the same person, but they are two personalities. When God expands, the expansion is at one level the same person, but it's also a different personality. So Krishna and Balaram contend with each other. There are times when Krishna and Balram, when Balram is the person closest to Krishna's heart, understanding every, the, the depth of the agony that Krishna is in, in separation from the But another time, Balram takes the opposite side of Krishna. And, now, you see, whenever we act in the world, we are actually living, we live in a complex world where we relate don't, we don't just relate with one person, we relate with multiple people. So for example, now if two people ask me a question, there is a time only for one question. And if I choose one person to answer the question, the other person will feel bad. So every action affects not just that person, it affects other, other people also. And that also has to be kept in mind when we act. That's why sometimes relationships become complex. Because when we are relating with one person, not relating only with that person. We don't live in, our relationships are not isolated, they are interpenetrating. So now at one level, Krishna, at level, level Krishna wants someone to contend with him. And so, so when somebody is, when say, if, if say somebody asks some favor from us, and normally we would do that favor to them. But if we do that favor, so somebody else will be very displeased with us. Then at that time, just to not displease this person, we may say no. 
this person is my hi it's a simple thing you can do it easily so then in the gambit of only this relationship so if you're saying no to someone it would it may not make any sense why are you saying no so one relationship cannot be seen only in the isolation from without considering other relationships so similarly we we said the krishna wants to reciprocate with balram or balram also is a play that role of being having someone of contending with of giving krishna someone to contend with so then for that purpose you know he has to connect with someone who is opposed to krishna so duryodhan himself does not have any intrinsic merit to attract balram's grace so when we talk about causeless mercy it is it is not that it does not have a cause but rather the cause is too less for the mercy <laughs> there is a cause and prabhupada gave the example of causeless mercy he said that suppose is once on a morning walk and there were some ducks who were quacking and there was a man who was feeding the ducks and there was one duck who was quacking quack, quack very loudly and his man was throwing more crumbs at him so prabhupada said krishna is like this he says if you beg more for mercy krishna will give us more mercy now the ducks quack quacking doesn't oblige the person to give them more quacking doesn't necessarily mean he has to give more so the cause is there but the cause is not enough for the reciprocity action so causeless mercy that means the cause is too less for the mercy so if we consider this on the spectrum then what do we have duryodhan he he is not even devotionally disposed at least he is not devotionally disposed toward krishna but then somehow duryodhan and balram they, you could say hit off they just like each other this is balram's causeless mercy it's not due to duryodhan's qualification but then as soon as duryodhan sees oh generally when we interact with people we can actually make up you know ah, this person actually wanting to be with me this person is tolerating me or is this person just waiting to find some weapon to hit me with so then he sees that oh balram likes me and then he also tries to ingratiate himself to balram so balram becomes pleased with him and then balram teaches him mace fighting now of course the pandavas and kauravas all of them have learned from drona and it is from drona that both duryodhan and bhima learn mace fighting but balram is a specialist it's like if you go to a university and learn some field say we go to mit and learn computer science but then if you after that you have got the degree but after that if somebody is a computer science genius and then you get to work with them you get to learn from them what you learn is much more so balram teaches duryodhan and in one sense among duryodhan and bhima bhima has the upper hand because bhima is physically stronger than duryodhan but then those odds which initially are say tilted towards bhima they change again because balram gives some special teachings tips and tricks to who duryodhana and does the odds level out actually more than the leveling out it's almost as if uh, if there is skill and strength the skill would eventually to trump maybe i should use the word trump <laughs> <laughs> okay so so what happens this is his it is his causeless mercy now what happens balaram so generally when we when we like someone or when we love someone then what happens we tend to trust their words or even if they done, even if we hear that they have done something wrong we tend to give them the benefit of doubt we let me find out actually what happened if we don't like someone and if we hear something bad about them 
we tend to immediately believe that <laughs> in fact you know gossip happens when what ha- what ha- what is the, what is the fuel for gossip see gossip happens when we hear something we like about someone we don't like <laughs> i just start so so <clears throat> now why am i talking about all this that if that when this whole uh, uh moral carnage happens in the kuru assembly when draupadi is attempted to be dishonored and then the pandavas are disposed of everything and then they go to the forest at that time krishna and balaram go and meet the pandavas in the forest and both krishna and balaram are furious This is atrocious. This is heinous. How did how did this thing happen? And then, but already, the they are obliged to be in the forest for thirteen years. And Krishna assures the Lord that those who have wronged you will will be punished. And then they come back. But then, Duryodhan comes to meet Balram. and duryodhan gives his whole own side of the story generally what happens whenever there is a conflict somebody comes and complain now each person tells their own side of the story and if you are in conflict resolution you understand that no story has only one side how many stories is such how many stories does a how many sides does a story have what do you think unlimited that is post modernism <laughs> yeah you could say that but um i could say at least the two disputants there are two sides of the story but usually if there are two disputants there are three sides of the story my side your side and the right side <laughs> <laughs> now this doesn't mean see both the people can be very honest sometimes we deliberately what happens we we downplay the wrong that we have done and we highlight the wrong that the other has done that's consciously we do it sometimes but sometimes even subconsciously memory is very slippery and sometimes we genuinely forget it doesn't it doesn't register to us so what happens we usually at least for ourselves can't tolerate a unflattering picture of ourselves <laughs> so when we tell the side of, when we tell story is always we'll tell it in such a way that we don't look like the bad guy in that so duryodhan tells his whole side of the story and the way he puts it he said that i never force duryodhan to this to gamble and any time he wanted he could have stopped gambling uh, if he was not good enough to gamble and yet he gambled and he lost everything i didn't force draupadi to be put on the stake so he he tells the whole story in such a way i was just playing a game what was put on the stake that is yudhishthir's problem and now somehow balram gets influenced by this and then Uh, just before after the 13 years are over then <clears throat> before uh, the the pandavas now have to decide the 13 years are over and as per the rules they have to <clears throat> they uh, they have they have to given their kingdom back but they don't uh, but there's no sign from the kauravas of any message so then the pandavas are thinking what to do so krishna is also there the drupada is also there so most of this meeting initially at least happens in the kingdom of virat where they have been in incognito and then balram also comes there and then balram basically is the pandavas is completely changed initially he was so angry this is a horrendous injustice what he says now he say 
Yudhishthir has no right to be angry with Duryodhan. It is because of his own fault that he has lost. And Duryodhan comes up with another story. What is that? When the uh, incognito exile gets over, that's the time when the when Arjuna comes out and he fights. So now if you see in an Indian calendar, there's a solar calendar, there's a lunar calendar. And if you consider Diwali, sometimes one part of India, now of course the time has been standardized and many times people be celebrated according to the national calendar. But if you go according to Pancham, the traditional calendar, so Diwali in Maharashtra and Diwali in Delhi might be on two different days. Like it happens in Janmashtami also. And as you know, the Janmashtami we celebrate on one day and the general Hindu community celebrates on other days, quite often. So what happens? <clears throat> this calendar conflicts keep happening. So what Duryodhan hides behind the calendar conflict and he says actually the incognito exile period is not over. It is supposed to be one year but one year is not over today. And Bhishma says the year is over. And Duryodhana says you always favor the Pandavas. He just doesn't accept it. And he does his own set of calculations. And he says the Pandavas have been found before the incognito exile is over. And they, the rule was if before that they are found, then they had to go again for 13 years, 12 plus 1 again. In fact, the condition was set in such a way that his hope was the Pandavas for the rest of their life would have to be in forest. Because he thought the Pandavas are so well known, they will just not be able to hide. They are, and if they are not able to hide, we find them. And in fact, the Mahabharata described that he sent thousands and thousands of spies to search for the Pandavas during the incognito period. And he was very frustrated when nobody could find him. It seems as if the Pandavas had dropped out of the face of the earth. And when he, uh, so he, when he finally found Arjuna, he was delighted. So now, somehow Balram accepts. Durudhana said, he says, actually, your case is not as black and white as you think. So he says, oh Pandavas, when you approach the Kauravas, you should approach them with humility. Yeah? Um, you know, uh, throughout the Mahabharata, uh, Krishna, he exhibits his all-knowing nature uh, in so many different pastimes where he arranges things because he's all-knowing. Mm -hmm. Why is it that in this scenario Balaram doesn't exhibit that all knowing nature feature that Duryodhana is obviously telling a lie? Okay. So, Krishna and Balaram are the same, and Krishna periodically exhibits his all knowing nature. So, why does Balaram not exhibit his all knowing nature? Naralila Kaivalyam. The uh, Vedanta Grand Sutra says that when the divine manifests for the purpose of performing Leela. And at that time, uh, there is a certain amount of uh, subordination of the divinity for the purpose of Leela. I give several classes I have given through Janmashtri on this topic that lovability is enhanced by vulnerability. That means if somebody is perfect or all powerful. When we want to relate with someone, we want to relate with somebody who is worthy, somebody who is special, somebody who is attractive. If we are forming a relationship, we want that person to be worthy. And that's how we understand that God is greatest, greatness. He's the greatest person, so he's worth relating with. But we not only want to form a relationship with somebody who is worthy, but another thing in any relationship is that we need to feel needed in that relationship. If that person doesn't need me only, then what is my value in the relationship? So, to have that depth of intimacy, uh, there is a need to feel needed. And how, how do you feel needed? When that other person exhibits some vulnerability. See, somebody is very powerful and they just solve all problems. And everybody who has problems come to them to solve their problems. But then if you are close to them and they say, actually, yeah, my heart is burdened by this. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. And at one level, 
You might say it's they're exposing themselves, but then that indicates a certain level of trust. Oh, it's only when you trust someone and you share your insecurities, fears, vulnerabilities. So this principle applies in normal relationships and applies in divine relationship also. So basically, for the purpose of Leela, Krishna, one way he exhibits his vulnerability is by not manifesting his Godhood, not manifesting his omniscience. And that's why when uh, Draupadi is attempted to be dishonored and then um, she survives, she, she's saved. Now we say Krishna came and gave her the unlimited sari. But nobody sees Krishna over there. All that they see is that her sari is inexhaustible. And they think that it is because of her chastity that her sari was mystically exhausted. In a, mystically became expanded unlimitedly. And later on when Draupadi meets Krishna in the forest, so Draupadi asks, Krishna, I called you. Why didn't you come? So I needed you. He says, I'm your devotee, I'm your friend, I'm your relative. I needed you. And Krishna, he doesn't put on the God cap. He says, my plan is perfect. How dare you challenge my plan? He says, so I didn't know. He says, at that time, a demon Shalva had attacked Dwarka and I was caught in defending it, devastating Dwarka. And I was caught in defending. As soon as I came to know, I immediately came here. So for the purpose of Leela, the Lord doesn't necessarily always exhibit his omniscience. And the same applies to Balram also. Okay. So now, <clears throat> the Pandavas are naturally disappointed. They thought that their cause is completely uh, justified. And they would get the complete support of the of the, of the Yadus, both Krishna and Balaram. But then everything, all their attempts for peace are foiled by Durudhana's arrogance. And then, just before the war, the, it becomes sure that the war is inevitable now. Then they have to, they, they are seeking allies. So now, Balaram wants to contend with Krishna. That contending is in terms of arguments, sparring. He doesn't want to fight against Krishna. And he knows that Krishna loves the Pandavas. So at that point, Krishna has not told that I am not going to raise weapons. So because of this, now, <clears throat> what happens is that Balram thinks that if Krishna fights on the side of the Pandavas, I, I cannot fight against Krishna. So it's like just like even in, in an affectionate relationship of friends there can be arguments. But the arguments have limits. No matter how heated the argument becomes, if the two friends, you won't come to fists. You won't start attacking each other physically. So like that, there are limits to, they shouldn't come at least. <laughs> <laughs> so now, uh, Krishna, so Balram doesn't want to fight against Krishna. So Balram takes a strategy that is quite, that is not uncommon in those times. And what is that? Sorry? Yes, pilgrimage. Yeah, goes on pilgrimage. So that's a very pious way of not taking a stand. <laughs> So Vidra also does the same thing. When the battle is happening, he just goes away. So he says, I'll not fight. Now, if you see, <coughs> he goes on his pilgrim he goes on the pilgrimage and his pilgrimage ends. About the time when the war is almost ended. Of course, he goes just he goes well before because this war is not like a ambush attack. It's certainly not like a terrorist attack. You know, sometimes people are very uncomfortable when they hear about the Bhagavad Gita led to the fighting of a war because now people are paranoid, paranoid about religious violence. And understandably so. But in the world of difference between the Kurukshetra war and whatever violence happens in the name of religion, terrorists or whatever. In general, the Kurukshetra war was fought between equals 
who were equipped and alert. It was fought between warriors. Terrorists, they attack only civilians who are not equipped and were not alert. So if you see this war, a, a place was decided, a time was decided, and they came and fought there alone. So it's a very different dynamic. The nearest we might get to terrorist violence, terrorist kind of violence in the Mahabharata is Ashwatthama's killing the sleeping soldier, the sleeping sons of the Pandavas. And that's universally condemned by everyone in the Mahabharata. So, anyway, so still the people, uh, the, the violence is there uh, because <clears throat> violence is a fact of life. It is not a desirable fact of life, but it is an unavoidable fact of life. Sometimes it is required. So then the war gets, so, so the point I think, he goes on a fairly long pilgrimage. It starts long before the war starts, but once the war is decided, once the sides are finalized, then the war goes. And on the 18th day, Duryodhan, uh, Duryodhan is left all alone. And he tries to hide and he's found. I'm not going to the full story. But when he's found, at that time, Balram comes over there. And now, Balram waits and watches. It's like, for Balram, it's a student. Sometimes it's like, say, a tennis. There are different kinds of sports. There are team sports and there are individual sports. So if a coach has trained somebody for individual sport, and maybe the Wimbledon final is there. The coach wants to see how is Wimbledon, how is my my ward going, my student, my player going to perform. So Balram sits and watches. And the Pandas are not very comfortable to see Balram over there. Because they know Balram might favor Duryodhan. But the fight goes on and on and on and on. And what has happened is it has become the fight has become like a rigged match. How a rigged match that say like uh, okay this might seem a mundane example so but I think it will illustrate the point uh, say in a cricket match now when a baller bowls and the batsman gets bowled out so in the so suppose the batsman gets bowled out. Now, sometimes, I, uh, I read somewhere recently that it happened in the recent World Cup that many times the ball would hit the stump, but the bales would not fall down. And then the batsman would be out, but be not out. <laughs> so, now suppose it's a cricket match in which it's ruled that the only way the batsman can get out, cannot get out in any way except bowling him out. Cannot, uh, no, no catches, no, no other, no, no out, no LBW. And the stumps are made in such a way, no matter how hard the ball hits, the stumps are not going to fall. Then what does the bats bowler do? See, it's like already Duryodhan and Bhima are like a very good match. One is stronger, the other is more skilled. But then in between to rig the match comes Gandhari's benediction. And Gandhari's benediction is that no matter what happens, no blow will injure Duryodhan. Now, if it's like that, how do you fight? There are times when Bhima hits Duryodhan so heavily that that blow could have like rend a hill apart. And when that blow hits Duryodhan, Duryodhan just flies away. But he flies and he lands and he gets up and he himself is amazed that nothing has happened to him. <laughs> so, then Bhima is shocked. What is going on? And then Krishna realizes that this is no way that Bhima can win. And then the fight goes on at one particular point and then because they are equally matched, so Duryodhan hits Bhima. So severely that Bhima is jolted. But because Bhima is a fierce warrior, 
he doesn't show the slightest pain. It's like sometimes uh, if we do something to disturb someone, we speak some sensational piece of gossip. And then there's no sensation. <laughs> we, we speak something to disturb others and if nobody is disturbed, then what happens? We get disturbed. <laughs> so, here, <laughs> don't you understand what I'm saying? Do you? <laughs> so, here, Duryodhana hits Bhima severely and Bhima acts as if he's unaffected. Although Bhima is severely wounded, battered, and when Duryodhana sees Bhima is not at all affected, Duryodhana becomes alarmed. And then he moves back. Because at, actually at that time, if Bhima had even winced a little bit, then Duryodhana would have taken advantage and Duryodhana could have killed him. He had been severely battered by that blow. It was such a fierce blow. But at this point, when Bhima, uh, so Duryodhana moves back and Bhima gets some breathing space and he recovers. But when the, the battle has been going on for a long time and Bhima has severely hit Duryodhana but to no effect. And Duryodhana has hit Bhima to significant effect. Although Bhima has not shown that. At that time, Bhima decides that this, this match is rigged. So if the match is rigged, then I cannot fight fair. Now Bhima has already taken a vow that he will break the thighs of Duryodhana. Because Duryodhana had used those thighs to uh, make an indec indecent proposition to, to, uh, to Draupadi. But Bhima's original plan was that he would defeat Duryodhana fairly and then break his thighs. But this match is rigged. It's like whatever Bhima does, he just can't win. So it's like this, now the baller is balling, balling and the batsman, no matter what, the batsman never going to get out. If you see in bowling, what happens in bowling and batting? It's the bowler who does most of the work. And the bowler has to keep running, keep running. The batsman just stands at one place and hits. <laughs> <laughs> so, like that, <laughs> Bhima is getting more and more battered and tired, and Duryodhana is unaffected. <laughs> so, what do you do at that time? So, finally, no. If a player cannot be get out, then you just get him out. How? Just you cannot get him out, make him retired hurt. So, you know, you can say body line. <laughs> 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 so, just ball in such a way that the batsman gets injured <laughs> and the batsman has to leave. So now this is what Bhima decides to do. Now Krishna has indicated this to Bhima uh, already. Krishna points the thighs. He says, you have to hit him on the thighs. So and Bhima has been trying to avoid that. Bhima wants it to be like a decisive win. But he realizes what to speak about being a decisive win, there might not even be a win now. So then he at the right moment he hits Duryodhana. And he hits him below the waist at the point of thigh. And that blow is so severe that you know, everybody can hear Duryodhana's bones cracking. And as Duryodhana falls to the ground, it's the match is over. And as soon as this happens, Balram springs up. Infuriated, and he looks around. He, he has his own hala, his, his own mm, plow. He charges towards Bhima. How dare you fight unfairly? And he bang is about to attack him. And then Krishna comes in between. And then Krishna speaks. He says, Actually, the Pandavas they were the victims of so much unfairness and what the Kauravas is own, they have reaped now. So, 
Balram is not satisfied. Balram says, Krishna, it's clear you are partial to the Pandavas. And the whole world will know that Bhima won unfairly. And still, because Krishna is favoring you, he walks away in half. So here, what is being happening over here is, it seems that Balram favors Duryodhan right till the end. But there is something deeper happening. See, broadly there are two conceptions of ethics. There is categorical ethics and there is contextual ethics. Categorical ethics is that good and bad are two categories. And whatever falls in this category is good, whatever falls in this category is bad. So for example, lying is bad, which is true. Now, categorical ethics are whatever happens, lying is bad. Lying falls in the category of bad and this category is inviolable, non-negotiable. Whereas contextual ethics ac acknowledges that there are moral categories, there are ethical categories. But we also have to look at the context. So suppose there is a violent mob on a riot and they are pursuing our friend. And that friend comes to our house and says, no, frantically, please save me. And we hide them maybe in the attic of our house. And the mob knocks on our door. Is he here? What should we do at that time? What should we do? Yeah, we can't speak the truth. Because <coughs> what does context mean? The Mahabharata says basically that right and wrong action is to be decided not just by the content of the action, but also the intent of the action and the consequence of the action. So, the categorical ethics means that only the content matters. What you are doing is all that matters. But contextual ethics means the intent and the consequence also matters. So, why is somebody doing something? You have to consider what is the result of doing that. So, normally lying is bad. But if lying produces a good result, or rather speaking, the truth produces a bad result. Then the right thing to do is speak the speak that which is not the truth. That's why we need not just values, but we also need the right. We, you know, we need the right values, but we also need the right hierarchy of values. Right hierarchy of values means speaking the truth is one value, saving somebody's lives is another value. So we need the right hierarchy of values. Which value is has more value in which context? So basically, this confrontation between Balaram and Krishna is this confrontation between contextual categorical ethics and contextual ethics. So categorically speaking, what Bal Krishna, what Bhima did was wrong. He hit him below the thigh. That's against the rules of the game. So categorically speaking, it's wrong. But if we consider in the context all the wrongs that they had done before, then this was just a minor wrong. So Krishna, that's what Krishna says, that actually the Pand the Kauravas are reaping the fruits of their own actions. So now when Balram says Krishna is just favoring Balram, Krishna is just favoring the Pandavas. That's his way of sticking to his point. So that means another point that is demonstrated over here is that, like I concluded, by, I started by saying that it's about how causeless mercy is also less for some people. That means somebody, so Balram was un, you could say almost unconditionally favorable to Duryodhan. But even then, that even if God is on your side, if you are not on the side of virtue, you will be destroyed. So, Balaram was with Duryodhan. But Duryodhan was consistently vicious. We all sometimes do some things wrong. And that's bad. But when we do something wrong, there is a difference between weakness and wickedness. Weakness is where 
we all have say lust, anger, greed, all these uh, anarthas, all these unhealthy religious drives within us. And sometimes we succumb to them. So weakness is basically hot-headed. Suddenly the urge comes and it overpowers us. So at least we have an intelligence and conscience with which we try to battle the immoral drive. But sometimes we are defeated. That's weakness. Whereas wickedness is where the intelligence is being perverted. The conscience has been deadened. And in wickedness, a person doesn't feel that I am doing anything wrong at all. And they use their intelligence not to rectify the wrong that they are doing, but to justify the wrong that they are doing. So wickedness, weakness is hot-headed. Wickedness is cold-blooded. It's cold-blooded. Where somebody is systematically, diabolically plans how best to hurt someone. And if that is the case, so weakness can be forgiven. Mercy can be given for weakness and that weakness can be overcome. But for wickedness, even mercy is not enough. Because that person doesn't even have the desire to change. See, God's grace can magnify even the slightest good that we may do or even the good desire that we may have. But God's grace, no matter how powerful it is, it will never overrule our free will. It will never overrule our free will. And in the case of wickedness, somebody, the person has basically committed to use their free will to do terrible things. So even God's grace is not enough for them. And that's why Balram, even with his unflinching support for Duryodhana, is not able to help Duryodhana. And what this very complex dynamic relationship between Krishna, Balram and Duryodhana demonstrates is that, that, that God, even if God takes the side of vice, but vice will be doomed by their own actions. So God is not just on the side of good. God is also on the side of the bad. But if the bad don't want to be reformed, then even God cannot help them. So God wants to help us, but he needs us to want his help, to seek his help, to want to change. We can help the unable, but we can't help the unwilling. We can't help the unwilling. And Duryodhan is unwilling and thus he is destroyed. So Balram serves Krishna in this extraordinary way by giving him someone to contend with. And through his actions he also demonstrates the dynamic interaction between causeless mercy and free will. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on this theme of <clears throat> How Balram's causeless mercy on Duryodhan is not enough for them. So I started by talking about how Krishna and Balram, they are best of friends. And in friendship, we want someone to spar with, someone to contend with. So Krishna has Balram play that role. And one way he plays that role is by taking the side of those who, whose side Krishna has taken. So at one level, God is on the side of the good. But on another level, is God transcends the sides. And if God takes sides in this world, God takes the side of the good, then, then God demonstrates that I, can, I will even take the side of the bad. So Krishna takes the side of the Pandavas, Duryodhana takes the side of the Kauravas. And then I talked about the principle of equality, reciprocity and mercy. They are like one spectrum. For a personal relationship, equality alone is not enough. Reciprocity has to be there. But in the human divine relationship, it's not just reciprocity, it's mercy. That we do a little and we, the Lord gives a lot more in return. And we talked about mainly in the relationship between Duryodhana and Balram, I talked about three main points, that the three main incidents. First was that he helped, somehow they hit off with each other and then he taught him skills special skills in mace fighting by which 
he became equal to Bhima was better than him in strength or he became superior and then he took the side of initially he felt that the Pandas had been dealt with unfairly but Duryodhan spun his side of the story and Balram felt that no it was Yudhishthira's fault that he gambled nobody forced him to and he told him to be cautious then because Krishna had chosen to fight against Krishna he knew that Krishna would support the Pandavas and he didn't want to fight against Krishna so he went on the pilgrimage but because he had trained Duryodhana so he wanted to see that final fight with Duryodhana and Bhima that's why he came back by that time and in that fight the match was rigged like a batsman whose stumps will never fall down so there's no way Bhima could have defeated Duryodhana and therefore because the match itself was unfair Bhima had to use an unfair wins to win this match <coughs> and the confrontation between Bhima and between Krishna and Balram at the end about the morality of Bhima's actions is the confrontation between <coughs> contextual ethics and categorical ethics what is right is determined not just by the content of the action but also by its context context means its intent and its consequences so Divorced from context, what Bhima did was outrageously wrong. But considered in context, <coughs> that was the only thing that he could do to get the right result. And thus he did that. So, because Duryodhana was not, had not just weakness but wickedness, and although he had Balram's support unstintingly, but if somebody is committed to vice, even God is not enough to save them. So God can help the unwilling, God can help the unable, but not the unwilling. And thus, Balram's causeless mercy, even his causeless mercy, is less, is too less to redeem Duryodhana. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So any questions or comments? Yes. This is one, I think, from one of the children a while ago. They were asking, why isn't Subhadra present in many of Krishna's childhood pastimes? Or is she? Anyway. Okay. Why is Subhadra not present in Krishna's childhood pastimes? Well, of course, you could say there's a contextual reason and there's a transcendental reason. Contextually, Krishna's birth it happens in mystery and secrecy, basically. So, the goddess basically <coughs> when she turns when that girl child who is born to Yashoda and is taken by Vasudeva to Krishna Vasudeva to Mathura she slips out of Kamsa's hand she appears as the goddess mm -hmm. so actually she is considered to be Subhadra but during that time because the whole idea was come, you have to throw Kamsa off the track of Krishna. So, what happens is, it appears as if to everyone that she has disappeared. And then she is not there in the childhood pastimes because in those childhood pastimes, primarily, it is that Kamsa, he suspects that Krishna is the real child, but he's never sure. Either. As he sees more and more demons being killed, it becomes more and more clear. But till then, it's not clear. And in general, in Vraja, except for Rohini, there is no one else who is not from Vraja. So Vraja has Vrindavan in a particular mood. And although Sumadra is a very, very intimate associate of Krishna, but in the mood of Vrindavan, Subhadra, her mood is more of the mood of work. Although she wants to come to Vrindavan, and the whole Jagannatha Thyatra is about coming to Vrindavan. But the flavor of that relationship is that she appreciates Vrindavan from outside. And thus, in Krishna childhood pastimes, because she has already been taken, so you know, if suddenly that girl who has disappeared, who we thought was the goddess, turns out to be the sister, and she's already there with Krishna, that will raise Kamsa's um, suspicion. So she just disappears in the childhood pastimes. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? So thank you very much. Shri Balaram Ji Ki. Jai. Shri Prabhupada Ki. Jai.
गौर भक्त बिंद की गौर प्रेमान दे so as was mentioned